evening, Jenny Keane. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to see you on my screen, but I know you, I don't know how, what do, how long do we know each other? 25 uh, years? Yeah, pretty much my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> Like that. So it's a bit strange to be having these conversations with you, I think. But anyway, I know you so well that I don't, it doesn't bother me in the slightest because I'm so thrilled for the success um, I, that you've just, you know, it's just fabulous to see the success that you are at the moment. So it's lovely for me to be able to share in that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure your mom is over the moon and, uh, she, and so she should be and your beautiful sister. Yeah. Um, I, I know they absolutely are. They're beaming about you. But anyway, um, so I just want to do a quick, I'll just do a quick intro because we've so much to talk about that. I don't want to waste time on who we all are. But so first of all, I want to thank everybody for, um, for beaming in tonight and for taking part in this over the last five weeks. It's just been great fun. We've talked about everything. Um, we started off with Mary McAleese, our ex-president, and we're ending on Jenny Keane. So um, it's been, a, it's been a, a lovely journey, I have to say. I've loved every second of it. And um, so, um, so what I'd like to do is, I, you, I know you obviously a very long time. I'll briefly just say that you were an animator, um, because obviously that's kind of in your past now. It does make up part of the person that you are, cre very creative, I'd say intense about stuff when you're doing it. Um, which suits an animator really and, um, and then of course you left your animation job about 10 years ago so I'm going to hand over to you now and let you tell your own story because I actually don't know Jenny what took you on your journey you're kind of I'd call it an eat pray love journey but for me that's how I kind of saw it happening so if you want to just tell us your story I'm going to start interjecting with a whole load of questions but okay. tell me why you left uh, Windmill Lane and how you ended up going on this amazing journey and you're definitely a trailblazer at the moment in our country so talk about that um okay <laughs> well thank you you know i actually it's funny just to say I, I i was speaking to my dad um he he i was in the car with him and we went for a walk and he and um, met some friends and they said well um how's your daughter and he's like well she's my orgasmic daughter now you know <laughs> and so he, he's like getting part of the conversation and so getting part of it was really funny <laughs> Um, but yeah, but my my journey uh, began, I suppose, uh, and the reason that I left the job that I had was because I very much recognized that um, I was really struggling. <laughs> and I was like, you know, in my early 20s, um, I had no social life. I was pretty much chained to a computer, working at least 14 hours a day and doing something that I had really wanted to do for my entire life. Like honestly, since I was the time that I was a kid, um, I wanted to become an animator. And, uh, and I, I went through all of this. And, you know, as I said, like I'm intense about things that I love. <laughs> so this was a part of it. But um, Essentially, I had a moment where I really just felt uh, my world break apart. And in that space, I was like, well, do I really want to continue living like this? You know, I'm, I'm in my early 20s. Is this what I want my life to look like? And uh, at that moment in time, and it was a very difficult decision. I had a secure job in a time when most of my friends didn't. It was a recession um, as well. And I decided to leave a permanent, like, you know, a secure position um in a creative field as well of all places and uh and 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 go off traveling basically um and be, i became a ski instructor actually is what i did and that was really because i felt it uh in my heart that i had to and that it wasn't a choice anymore that it was like if i was going to stay it was going to break me and i i always say this like that i really believe and there's a really beautiful poet called mark nepo that says you're either broken open or you willfully shed and I think we all have these moments in our life which are breaking moments and um, full of challenge and full of struggle and they come in many different shapes and sizes and many different stories but ultimately they set you on a path and on a direction that I really think that you're supposed that your 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 life is trying to lead you to anyway you know so yeah. So where did That's you go what happened, Jenny? Where? Oh, you went just. I went. I went to New Zealand first. I went to New Zealand first. That was also part and parcel of get me as oh, far away from New Zealand or, or far away from Ireland as possible. Um, and uh, and so I chose New Zealand and became a ski instructor, and uh, it set me on a really beautiful path of really really understanding that actually 
the way that we live life and the way that we're told that we are supposed to live our life doesn't actually have to be the case. You don't have to go through school. You don't have to get the perfect job. You don't have to find the perfect man, let's say in my case, because I, I, I have a tendency towards being with men. Um, you don't have to get uh, married, have a, a house, have a family, but actually your life can look very different, you know? And I chose that moment in time where I was kind of like, you know what, I'm going to try as many jobs as I can, have as many careers as I can. And uh, I mean, once I found yoga and that as a job, I, I stopped at that point because for me it was like, oh, <laughs> this is me now. <laughs> okay. So, where did you go after New Zealand? Uh, California. And California was incredible. I went there to ski instruct, but California is a very open, uh, really, especially Lake Tahoe where I was, very open, very spiritual, um, I want to say community, you know? And so I, I had incredible teachers in yoga there um, who would be kind of like kind of superstars in the yoga world uh, now. And, and they really opened my eyes up to this kind of like new way of like, like discovering yourself, discovering your sexuality before any of it was even on the map, you know? I feel like uh, California is really progressive this, you know? Uh, so that's where I was for a couple of years. And I, I kept returning and then from there I went to Asia. And once I landed in Asia, uh, that was where I, I've been there since I was there for when I was from, I went in 2015 and I did my yoga teacher training and I ended up staying there because for me, I was like, this is, this is where I need to be, you know? And, and I stay there studying and uh, in, in the particular part that I was in, they called in like that particular area calls in a huge amount of um, incredible teachers um, from all walks of life. And there's often, there's also a like huge um, access to, you know, uh, open sexuality and um, discussing sexuality in a way that I had never e experienced before and it was very much that it's something that was always really interesting and um, something that always excited me you know <laughs> so when I found that I was like I'm home did you feel I oh god almighty I'm mortified I'm Irish I'm not able for this was it did you have that at all or not no, I, I never had that. I would have been like from, from, from when I was a kid, I would have always been very open with regards to my sexuality. Uh, not in the sense that I would have, I mean, my parents were amazing. My mom was incredible and really spoke to me about sexuality when I was younger. Like she, um, uh, like she celebrated our period when it came, which is kind of unheard of, you know, uh, for most people. But I remember my sisters, I have a twin, you know, I have a twin sister and her period came first and we went out and got like my sister a period present. And I remember then being excited for my period to come so that I could get a present, you know, whereas I think most times we're given the information that like, oh, your blood is a burden now for the rest of your life. It's something that's going to be horrible and you're going to have to, you know, it's going to happen once a month and it'll be terrible and you might not be able to go to school you know so all these things that you're fed and I had a very different um a very different upbringing with regards to this now I wasn't totally fair I wasn't totally open with my parents they would try to discuss things with me and I was very much like a defiant teenager like no no like <laughs> I'm not talking about this, you know but yeah. my parents found other ways. Like my mum took me to a bookshop and told me to pick out a book on sex when I had a boyfriend. And I was like, I'm not going to have sex, you know? And she's just like, I was like, I'm too young. And like, she's like, we're not leaving until you pick the book out. And so I was just like, oh, like not even looking and just like chose it, you know? I was like, this one. <laughs> and then that night I'm like literally diving into everything, you know, reading it like under, under the covers with a torch, you know? <laughs> Um, and so I've already, I've already had this. So your own periods were terrible. Oh yeah, like from the terrible. time. And this was actually what, I, 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 this is what actually brought me on to the path that I'm on now. Yes. So from the moment that I started menstruating, I had awful issues with my period, with my menstrual cycle. I had uh, like, I was in hospital when I was 16 with cysts on my ovaries that were bursting. And um, I was put on the pill really young and um, before I was having sex, simply because it was the only option available to me. And I had like acne all over my face. And so all I heard was, this is going to stock your spots. And I was like, give it to me, you know? Um, because obviously you're a teenager and you're very much concerned with how you look, you know? And so 
Um, when, I, when I started traveling, um, and I'd been on a very strong pill, and when I started traveling, uh, my prescription for the pill ran out, and I was thinking, well, like, I have the GP isn't here, so I don't know how to get the pill here. So I just stopped taking it, and uh, I wasn't sleeping with anybody anyway, so I was like, this is fine. But I realized when I came off the pill that um, uh, the men that I was attracted to really dramatically shifted. Like, <laughs> How is that possible? I, I don't know. Like, honestly, I, I was so shocked because I would have been quite conscious anyway, but it, it was so different that I was like, what? Like, I, the first guy that I fancied when, once the kind of pill like, started coming out of my system was um, a, 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 a guy who was really skinny, shorter than me, really beautiful, really sweet, really funny, you know? And uh, but I remember, he looked a little bit like Harry Potter, okay? And previous to this, I would have been with guys who were much taller than me, really built out like they had to be in the gym like I met the men that I liked like I went to the gym to meet people because these are the men that I like they had to have bigger legs than me they had to have way bigger arms you know and so and even the, the type of smell of the men that I was attracted to changed as well and so when I started to realize this I was like oh my god I, I, I wonder is this to do with the pill and then I was like what if like what if I go what if I end what if I go back on the pill and I end up with somebody like marrying somebody that I don't end up liking it's only the it's the pill that's making me like them you know so I decided at that point I was never taking the pill again and my my menstrual my menstrual cycle came back with a vengeance I was actually okay for a year to be honest and uh, it came back even more violent than ever. And it, it came back when I returned to Ireland, which was really funny. So I think being stress-free while I was traveling also helped. Um, but when I came back, I came back with a vengeance and it was more, um, more violent than ever. I'd have a violent fight with someone three days before I bled. And I never knew when I was going to bleed because my period would come between 39 and 75 days. Um, but three days before I would bleed, I would have this violent fight. I'd be like taken over by this, possessed by what I was calling a crazy girl, you know? And I'd be like, ah! And um and then I'd be on the floor for 10 days with cramps going up and down my back and my poor mum, like, because I was very much about like, you know, I'm not taking the tablets, mum. She's coming up with like ginger juice for like shot ginger for me, you know? Um, and so I went to the gynecologist and her, I basically said, this is what the story is. Um, my only thing is that I don't want to back on the pill or any kind of hormonal contraception or, or hormonal, um, uh, hormonal birth control and I uh, but I want to figure this out and after weeks of being with her countless tests I was told I have PCOS probably of endometriosis I'm infertile and my own option is to go back to the and for me at this point I left like devastated for a number of different reasons but mostly for the fact that I was like this is like after spending all this money, like I don't want this to be my only option. So I was already into yoga. I was already into the spiritual and holistic side of things. And so I decided that there had to be another way. And this is where I went, like, like as you said, like I'm an intense person anyway. So I literally went like, boom, like straight down the rabbit's hole of give me everything you have. And I researched um, the best, the top people in the industry who were talking about holistic methods and um, from functional nutritionists to um, OBGYNs and to clinical researchers, everybody um, that I could get my hands on. And I also contacted them and I said, uh, this is who I am. Um, I would like to study under you. Is that possible? And a lot of them, I think out of sheer shock, took me on and they became my mentors, um, mostly because they were like, who are you? And I was like, I teach yoga. <laughs> and they're like, what is this person doing? And uh, But for me, it was like sucking up all this information. And obviously then I had my tantric practices and um, energetic practices. And then this is also what led on to the sexual side of things, because for me, um, none of these are separate from each other. They're all together. You know, it's a holistic view. It's a whole method. And it, it's, it links to absolutely everything, you know, as a woman, uh, you know, who has a menstrual cycle, it links into your libido and your sex drive. Um, and it, it continues, you know, so that would have been how I got into it. <laughs> because I do think the going down the sexual thing is, it is brave because you have to talk to people about 
um, stuff that in general in Ireland we don't talk about. Even periods. I mean, I, I did say to you the other day or this morning or something when we were chatting that in New Zealand, and I know, I know I'm always harping on about Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, who is like one of my heroes. Mm. But she's charged a whole period thing for teenage girls in the schools because 25% of girls in New Zealand don't go to school when they have their periods because they're afraid of leaking or embarrassment. And so she's supplying tampons and um, uh, all some sanitary gels and all sorts of things to, to uh, funds for them for poor children or for children who need them. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought it was such an amazing thing that they have these this whole period program starting now to talk about it in the open because really we kind of don't talk about it. It's kind of icky for everybody to talk about. Yeah. I know in this house, my husband used to always say to my daughter, you know, he, every time he'd go to spa, she'd say, would you get me a whatever a package of tampons? And he'd say, why don't you, like, why do you wait till I'm going to spa to ask me to get them? You know? <laughs> but I, he always did in fairness. But at the same time, I think it's still an icky subject in Ireland, no matter what. It's an icky subject that men kind of just don't talk about it. And then that brings you, that brought you on. Jenny, can I just ask you before we move off that subject, did it help your pain? Did all oh, of that stuff? All of it, all of it went. So I basically went from having completely irregular cycles to now, um, first of all, my cycle reduced 39 days. And two years ago, it actually went now to like a proper monthly cycle. Um, I don't have PCOS. Uh, I don't have endometriosis. I, um, I'm not infertile. I have, um, so how basically- did, how, how did that turn around, Jenny? How did you change that around? Uh, well, for me, it was, for me, it was coming back into rhythm for me, it was coming back into rhythm with my own cycle. So, um, on a physiological, uh, side of things, anything that happens. So even for example, PMS, um, and this is the major problem is that we know so little about our bodies. Like women remain mystified by their bodies and they actually think that PMS is the normal consequence of having a period because this is the information we're being fed, you know, that it's like, oh, here's the moody, you know, moody so-and-so now for, you know, are you on your period, you know, oh, it's shark week, you know, and you get given all these things or it's like, you just have to, it's kind of like when you have your period, it's like, well, you just have to accept if you got handed, um, you know, a, a, a terrible, irregular, you know, painful period, that was the, the kind of cards you'd be dealt. And we don't get told that there is an option to interact with our cycle. And so because of this, and we just don't have the education behind it, we, we're, we remain mystified and we just leave it kind of ourselves up to the hands of whatever we were given. And at a physiological, like a physical, physical level, uh, just at a, at a physical level, it is a hormonal imbalance. That's what it's saying yeah. to you. And PMS is, I always say this in my workshops, that if you have PMS, it is a signal. It's basically your body ringing a fire alarm to say something is not correct here. And because we have monthly cycles, we are different people every month. And for a lot of women during COVID and during lockdown, ex experienced much worse cycles than normal. I did as well. And, uh, and this is due to like, so um, stress has a huge effect. What you eat has a huge effect. And so for me, having a look, not just at the physical side of things, but also the energetic side of things, helped me to bring my cycle back into rhythm. And so allowing myself to move with my rhythm and maybe i'll just say one thing here which is really interesting because men have a hormonal cycle as well which is a 24-hour cycle and the world we don't speak about it because the world caters to the 24-hour cycle we wake up in the morning we have energy this is what happens in a man's body okay we during the middle of the day the afternoon we have this kind of drive to like push through the day and in the evening it's time to relax to wrap to rest down to restore at night time we reset okay that's a man's 24-hour cycle a woman's cycle moves over the course of 29.5 days let's say and uh, or whatever your cycle is and we are made to kind of go off uh, the, the male hormonal cycle. And so we're trying to fit ourselves into this little box. So it's no wonder that then we get given the information of go on the pill to stop your periods altogether because you have to, you have to be in work. And every week as a woman, 
uh, we are different, you know, how we operate di is different, what we need is different, uh, our, our access to energy is different week to week, week by week. And if we learn to live in rhythm or cycle in harmony with that energy, we find that we instead of pushing against it and feeling ourselves depleted and tired and exhausted, you know, um, we would find ourselves having access to more energy, to more power that we can leverage and put into all aspects of our life, into work, into our family, into ourselves, um, and so into our relationships. And so this is really what I, what I was ended up doing and saw it work for me. And so I very much was just like, I, I, I think every woman in the world should know this. And so that was yeah. what I went Let's, into in terms of teaching. So holistically, you literally went from being told you were infertile to holistically curing that. You're yeah. saying. Yeah. And, and, and for me, it was a very strong feeling. I remember sitting in the car with my, with my mum and uh, really like I was, I was really affected by this news. I mean, um, especially from someone who's worked with kids since they were, since, they were, since I was a kid myself and had always imagined myself in a space where like, I remember when I was a kid being like, I want seven children and I want them hanging out of each arm, you know, and one on my head, you know, uh, or each arm, like each limb, you know, and a couple, one on my back and one on my head, you know, and I remember uh, that this is what I, uh, this is what I had a desire for. Now, obviously that's changed because I'm much older now and I realize how long I'd have to be pregnant for in order for that to happen. So I'm, I don't want that so much now, but um, but so for me, it was devastating news. And, uh, but at the same time, it was like a lightning bulb just like hit me in the head. Mm. And I, I had this sense of like, oh my goodness, like wait, all of this, everything that's been happening, like, you know, the, the pain that I've been experiencing, my, the, the cramping and all that kind of stuff. That is a sign. My body is saying that my womb is saying pay attention to me and it was literally like banging at my door and I really I I because I didn't know that there was an option to interact with this myself I had to get to a point where it was like breaking point you know for me and um and so for in terms of what I'm doing now it's like I'm trying to teach women like there are options to work with whatever you're going through whatever it is mm -hmm. and there are other options and for me i'm i'm also as well i, I have to say this and say it from the outset like i'm not against the pill i also am not against medical uh medical um intervention. Intervention. interaction as well for me i really believe that it's about having you know a full team around you that you can have access to so many different resources and and uh, and for and that's what I did. I went to everybody, like everyone from you know like proper like medical professionals to naturopaths to um, people who work with witchcraft. You know, like I literally went down everything. And for me, uh, bring all of that together. There's something that you can pull from from everyone. every aspect of that. Okay, so then talk to me. Let, okay, let's get on to the juicy bits now. Let's move <laughs> yeah. on to the juicy bits. So um, I, 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 I copied this thing the other day out of Facebook, which just reminded me of you, Jenny. Um, and it's an extract from a sex education school textbook in the 1960s in the United Kingdom. When you are retiring to the bedroom, prepare yourself for bed as promptly as possible. This is for a woman, advice to a woman. While feminine hygiene is of the utmost importance, your tired husband does not want to queue for the bathroom as he would have had to do for the train. But remember to look your best when going to bed. Try to achieve a look that's welcoming without being obvious. If you need to apply face cream or hair rollers, wait until he's as asleep, as this can be a very disappointing last thing at night. It goes on then to say, um, if he feels the need to sleep immediately, then so be it. Um, in all things, be led by your husband's wishes. Do not pressure him in any way to stimulate intimacy. Should your husband suggest Congress, that's obviously sex, then agree humbly all while with being meaningful that a man's satisfaction is more important than a woman's. When he reaches his moment of fulfillment, a small moan from yourself can be encouraging to him in a quiet, sufficient way to indicate any enjoyment that you may have had. It goes on to say, set your clock early in the morning to make his tea when he wakes up as well. So when I saw it the other day, I smiled and thought of you because <laughs> um, clearly this is not the advice you're giving out at the moment. But anyway, just to say, I did do one of your classes and it was amazing on Zoom um, regarding female orgasm. And I did the kind of initial class 
Um, and I wasn't being nosy or voyeuristic. I was actually genuinely interested and it was really interesting and you were unbelievably informative. Mm -hmm. And I know you've gone on to do this big 30 day one, which I believe is just amazing because a friend of mine is doing it. And I believe it is just, you, you, you're swamped. The biggest orgasm party on earth, I think, is one of the things I heard you saying the other morning on Instagram. <laughs> so just to move on to that. It's, I mean, we're not talking an orgy here. We're talking about un something that's incredibly educational, incredibly informative. So one of the th one or two, many of the things that you said shocked me. Like up to nine years ago, they were still naming bits of the women's body that we clinically didn't even know had names. Um, but talk to me about your class. How first of all, it's you were doing it face to face and then Zoom, I think maybe launched it because people maybe felt they could do it with, with, without being seen or heard and they could do it you know, in, discreetly at least. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing class, but I was shocked at your openness um, because people find words hard to say, you know, get them out like vulva, hard to say, clitoris, hard to say. We're not used to saying it in public forums at all. Yeah. Um, it's a bit like Gay Byrne putting the condom on the banana 30 years ago. Like it was, oh my God, look what he's doing. It's a shocker. <laughs> but people like you are breaking down barriers that need to be broken down. So tell me about your whole, this whole orgasm business and where it began and how successful are you finding it? Uh, my goodness. I'm, I, I put up a post today about it because I just said, you know, uh, in, I started orgasm online two months ago, not even two months ago, it's seven weeks ago. And in that space, 1,500 women have been at orgasm online, which I just think is, for me, it's like, like I said this in the thing, like I'm, I'm shocked and I'm in awe and I'm deeply humbled, but I'm also as well, like part of me is just like giving this like, you know, little like fist bump yeah. in the air to be like, at last, you know? And, and it's exactly like for, you know, that thing that you read out, it's just, it's so interesting because we come from, as women, we come from a, a, a kind of a, a society that has taught us that our pleasure is secondary um, or even like not important, you know, to a, a man's pleasure. And, it, and, and there are still women that I meet that still believe this. And so for me, um, I remember I met one woman last year who said, um, she had been married for 19 years and was just out of that relationship. And it, it, she came to orgasm online or at orgasm, but in person in the workshop. And she came up to me at the end and said, no one told me that pleasure could be, I could have pleasure. That was something that was never said to me. I didn't even know it was a possibility. And so I feel like you have just changed my entire world, you know? And so for me, it's always like, I mean, I haven't changed her world. She had the courage to come to that space where mm. that was said, you know, I think it's definitely her, her power, you know? But um, this started, I started, um, my first orgasm class was in 2016. Um, and it, it kind of started just because I came home from Thailand and my friends were like, what are you doing? And I was just like, oh, yoga, because I was like, well, I'm definitely not telling them what I'm actually doing. And, uh, and they're like, no, it's more than yoga. You, you look completely, you are glowing, you know, uh, what are you doing? And I was just like, oh no, it is yoga. And they're like, no, like you, we're not going to move on from this conversation until you tell us. And I was like, okay. And then I dived in and told them all about the sexual side of what I was doing. And they were literally, every single one of them was just shocked didn't say anything but when I went home that night we all had like a group you know messaging thing you know every <laughs> single one of them sent me a message privately saying Jenny please tell us more about what you're doing they were like oh my god what you said like I couldn't get over it like I want to know more and every single one of them said it and I said right I put back in the in the main group I said right every single one of you have messaged me privately. You all want to know, you're all curious. And so basically orgasm started from that space. So I was just teaching them what I learned. And then I opened it up to students who were coming to my yoga class. And then every year that I came home from Thailand, I continued that on and it got bigger and bigger. And it was very much just word of mouth, very much because I'm very open anyway. So if you know me, you know that I talk about this. I say it in my yoga classes, I say the word sex, you know? <laughs> And people are like, 
in the beginning and then it's you know it's it's fine you know yeah yeah it's like did she just say that you know and um and then obviously lockdown gave people the access to be like oh well I can't go in person anymore to yoga classes so I have to go on zoom and that I think platform allowed my work to really grow because as you said you could be you could be a not it was mm-hmm. women only, I think, that I did, I, the night I did it anyway, it was women only, which I can understand why it's oh, women only, yeah. you know, yeah. appropriate that needs to be. Like, so, like, I'm 57 the other day, but, I mean, I, I wouldn't have felt um, ever that it, it was more important for a man, really. I, I'm not sure my generation really did, but certainly before my generation, they probably mm-hmm. would have. It was more about that, but... I so what my what I got from listening to the girls the night of yours because some of them were commenting just was the sense of empowerment. It was like suddenly young girls in their twenties and thirties, who are much younger than me, now are feeling that. Now I hate using the word feminist because I think we all run away from the word feminist at times because you think of kind of scary people that you know do scary feminist mad feminist stuff. But I think suddenly women are feeling that they're equal. <laughs> not better then, but just equal to men in the bed. And whereas that probably is, you know, that came across to me from the girls that I was just listening to and watching the comments down the side. Suddenly I think they felt you gave them the confidence to be able to say things like, I want this and I like that. Whereas before that they were afraid to say anything. Mm. Um, and for I, me, yeah, go on. Oh no, I was just gonna say, I think it's just, for me, it's really about, um, when you, I think as a, for me, like I really embody what I'm talking about. I've been in a space where, you know, uh, things weren't going, weren't going well for me. I felt disconnected from my own self, from my own body. And as a result, I was very much even sexually in a space where I was performing and not necessarily getting full enjoyment, even though I thought like, oh, I'm really enjoying this and I'm having great fun and we're having a great connection. But um, when I started to really slow down and connect to myself and, and listen to what I wanted and what I didn't want, I, it, that, that pleasure started to expand. And I think when you are, when you're really embodying something, you can allow your, like for me, I always see it as a spark that you're giving other people the permission to explore it as well um, and it's also as well it's to understand I think the, one of the biggest things for women is to understand that you're not alone in what you're going through that uh, you have a whole community of people around you who might not be talking about it but you're not alone and so for me this what what we're doing is not just you know it's not just sex education it's also about uh, and, and not just kind of like charging forward with like giving people the language to talk about something that just hasn't had doesn't have language around it yet but also creating a community where it's like uh where people are where women are saying i've experienced this as well you know and so in that feeling of not being alone and um, there's support and acknowledgement and also safety you know um to to explore and discover for yourself you know I found when you were some of the things you were talking about because I work with young um, teens and um, I found what you you call it this lovely word your yoni which is your your middle bit you know your your yeah. your ovaries your vagina your all your women's bits I don't know what I want to call it but it is a gorgeous word it's a yoga word obviously it's a just it describes all of those parts. And it's a lovely soft word. It's not a bit, you know, it's not a bit vulgar, but and you were talking about respecting it um, and not letting anybody do anything to it that you didn't want done to it. And I think that's such a message that should be given to young teenage girls because I don't think they're getting the right education at all. Jenny, where do we start with that? Where the hell do we start with that in in schools nowadays? I think it's really important that, I mean, uh, for me, it's definitely with, and this is why I'm also teaching women. For me, it starts with the parents you know and um, because children are getting this information whether you like it or not and I think that if you aren't control of the conversation you aren't in control of 
where they're getting that information and who's telling them what. And so, you know, I, I, I read um, this really interesting paper that said that, you know, in 2000 and I think it was 2010, that the average age that uh, children were learning about sex was nine years old. And a couple of years ago, that's now gone down to six. So by, by the age, by age six, they, they know what sex is. And I think this is shocking for people to hear, but um, because oftentimes we want to kind of think, oh no, they're children and, you know, let's keep their innocence and they're going to grow up too soon, you know, if we tell them about this. And so instead of giving them correct information when they say, where do babies come from? Instead of saying the truth that we say, um, oh, you know, it comes from a stork in the sky or, you know, or when, when a child says like, oh, you know, mommy's, uh, you know, my, my sister is in my mommy's belly, you know, instead of correcting the child and saying, no, your, your sister or your brother is in, is in my uterus, you know, and so using the actual terms um, and not shying away from this is really, really important because they learn to grow up then with the correct information, because if you don't give it to them, they will turn to uh, the internet, you know, or they'll turn to their friends who more than likely have turned to the internet and the most um, readily available source of information that they have and they will seek it is porn. And porn is giving a very specific message. It is telling you that the end goal of, of sex is an ejaculation. And once that happens, it's over, you know? And so again, even with that, with regards to women, it's that um, your pleasure is secondary to the man and, uh, and that you end up as, as girls, they get fed the information that um, they have to please the man, you know, so uh, they're instantly put in a space where they might not think, oh, I have the option to say no to this, you know, and so it's about discussing, I think it's about really getting in, you know, uh, getting parents to comfortable enough to have these conversations. And I think that often starts with, well, what does that conversation look like? And is it okay to have it? Um, and, you know, uh, I have spoken about this before with, um, with uh, parents that, you know, at, at different ages, you know, that you teach, you know, your children, um, but it's okay to teach your four-year-old or your three-year-old that, her, uh, her, her, that, that her genitals is called, on the outside, it's called a vulva. Mm -hmm. It's okay, you know, and, and to have like a language around this, that, you know, this is yours, you know, and no one is allowed to touch this, you know, but we, we shy away from these conversations and mm -hmm. um, because we think we're keeping them safe. And in fact, um, we're, we're, we're giving very negative information to them. So for example, we we're trying to, parents are trying to keep their kids safe uh, girls are becoming teenagers and they're expressing their sexuality and they're being told you can't wear that short skirt and they might not say anything else but the underlining message is if you wear a short skirt you're asking for it mm -hmm. and that's not that's not correct either you know and so teaching uh, girls and boys you know the correct information um, you're teaching them the language of consent you're teaching them that sex is for pleasure it's not just you know um, sex is you know a bad thing well, and the risk factors of sex is going to be detrimental to the rest of your life it's going to mess up your life you know like as 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 a young girl i was told you know if you have sex you're going to get all these stis um and you mm -hmm. might get pregnant uh, or and you're going to get pregnant so you just better not have sex at all i was never told that pleasure is an option i was never told that i can actually say no if i want to um and so we don't get given the we don't like mm -hmm. Debbie, like we teach our children everything. We teach them um, manners, you know, we teach mm -hmm. them, uh, you know, how to um, be successful in life. We teach them, you know, how to like manage a business. We teach them how to cook, you know, we teach them everything, but we don't teach them about sex. And I'm just kind of like, why, why not? And for me, I really believe that the conversation around sex is no different to the conversation around how to cook an apple pie, you know, and yeah. um, you're giving yeah, your children we, life lessons. We, what do you think? What's your opinion on, on, I know obviously the children have too much access to porn and it is leading to all of these problems with 
you know, girls being videoed while they're giving someone a blowjob and all this kind of stuff. Like, and people think it's really titivating to put it up on social media or it's just like, it's so, it's so degrading. Mm -hmm. And yet all the classmates think it's funny to show it. So we've got to go right back to basics. What is your, first of all, how can we control porn? Uh, can we control porn on their phones? And like children with the age of eight and nine, seeing women that are shaved, that have, you know, no body hair, that are men that are all huge and muscled, like men, men aren't, women aren't like that. How do we control that? It's, I, it's so warped. I don't think that it's necessarily about controlling that because unless something really shifts in society, it's not something we control. But what we do have control over is how we educate our children. And uh, to say like, you know, to even sit down and say, like, you know, like, would it be so bad to sit down with your child and say, this is what porn looks like, you know, but this is, this sex is, is performance, it's for TV. Like, do you ever think about what this person is? This is their job, you know, they're trying to make money from this. Like, do you think like outside, you tell them the context of what porn is. And I think like, if you, if you, if you, children are really smart and they can sit down and take this information in and then they get to choose whether or not they engage in, you know, looking at porn. But if you're giving them the information, they're not going to have to seek it somewhere, somewhere else, you know? And I think this is the biggest thing. Like I was, I was saying this, uh, I said this um, before, but in the Netherlands, they have um, this, uh, this beautiful concept. And it's the same way that we would have a sports week in school. They have a, a week that's called the week of love and they teach children about consent. They teach them about boundaries. They teach them about um, communication. They teach them about sex. Uh, they teach them everything. And what they were finding from this is that things like, you know, uh, even like, because we, we have fear that if we give children the information, they're going to be like super curious and everyone's going to start having sex, you know? Um, and that isn't the case. What they found was that uh, children became more conscious of their sexuality that actually bullying went down um, which was a really interesting thing because suddenly now people had the language around uh, you know someone who's expressing their sexuality and what that looks like you know that that actually is their choice to express that sexuality and so oftentimes like girls get labeled as being a slut you know for mm -hmm. for doing like something that is actually he's quite a legend. He's what? A legend. He's a legend for doing the same thing. The boys are legends. The yeah. girls are yeah and again this is that same that same kind of information that society is leading into us you know um, and it's again it's subliminal you know often as well like girls are being told you know what uh what a what's what a sexy body looks like and um they're also being they're also being told very very pointedly um through social media that this is how you use your sexuality as currency that and and you know it's very important to kids their developmental years just as they grow, you know, developmentally become a, you know, a, a, an infant, a child, a teenager, an adolescent, like all this, they also have a sexual development as well that they move through. And as teenagers, part of their expression of sexuality is done in relationship to their peers. And so they're learning what is what is correct and what is not correct and that's from their friend group but nowadays because of their access to social media their peer group becomes more than just what we would have had which is very much our close-knit friends or our, the girls or boys that we were going to school with it, it's global so they're looking to people like kylie jenner and is that is it kylie jenner and kendall jenner yes yeah yeah they're looking to, to these younger girls so the younger sisters and they're seeing like okay this is what a sexy body looks like she has one million followers or whatever so if i so they're being, yeah they're being fed the information that if i dress like this if i look like this then i'm going to be successful boys are going to like me um and also as well you know if you i don't know if you know it's right now there's a huge um there's a huge expression around in, in, in schools. It's, it's a little bit further than uh, further forward than what we would have, but a huge expression in schools around expressing your sexuality. So whether you like girls or whether you like boys and, um, and, and who you're dating. So girls are having girlfriends and boys are having boyfriends. 
much younger than we would have been expressing ourselves. And again, giving kids the language to understand and also the tools to navigate this terrain, I think is super, super important. And I think the more we shy away from it, the more they're going to go to other sources. And then that's the issue. So the issue isn't that porn is out there. Porn, I think, yeah, is always porn. going to be out there. Yeah. yeah but but it's like, can you, what are you doing at home to control, you know, um, and yes. the information that they receive? Because this is where we learn about sex. This is where we learn relationships um, from being at home, you know. We learn um, how to express anger through uh, our parents, you know, like from, from watching, you know, what what is around us. We learn to express love the same way, you know. So they're, they're constant, they're sponges, they're sucking up information. And there is beautiful, um, there is a beautiful movement when it comes to porn and it's called, you know, uh, there's this one uh, website called Make Love Not Porn. And this woman is incredible when it comes to speaking to kids and adolescents about sexuality as well. And, you know, the more you could put uh, people towards that point of view, the more it, it, um, it, I will, I will say like it, it takes it, it doesn't sensationalize sex anymore it makes it normal it makes it conversational so it means that your children can come to you and say like this happened to me and I don't know how to handle this situation you know and so they're not they're not keeping that inside for themselves you know that they know that there are places that they can go to to talk you know things through and I think that's important okay Okay, Jenny, I want to, we can't go on all night because this thing is good, just goes on too long and we, we could talk all night because I would talk about this all night. So I want, I'm going to just, um, somebody asked me to ask you today about your, you are too young to obviously be, be menopausal. That doesn't mean you don't know everything about it uh, because obviously it's, it's in that whole area. But when it comes to women and menopause, you up, there's not enough, I think there's not enough support in the country. I, I, luckily I'm, I've never had any symptoms and I'm finished I think I mean I've, I don't I never started and I never finished I just never never experienced it but um so I what have you ever thought about doing because your support is, is having such an impact on women from, from the from the comments I'm reading from them you're changing lives menopause I think women feel washed out on the shelf broken down dried up <laughs> you know yeah. never have sex again and uh, well, not always of course because now of course, women I suppose are getting much more empowered and all the rest of it and they're healthier and fitter and all the rest of it but still it does have an impact on women I think okay. um, do you think does should it be like that have you thought about it or do you work with people who are experts in the field uh yeah so and I actually do um I've done workshops in the past and at the moment I'm just trying to get a structure around what's manageable for me at the moment but I do intend to put all this content out there like in a really like as as, as an open way as possible so people can access it but like one of the biggest messages that I say is that like you know you know you are a sexual sensual being from the time you're born to the time that you die and actually that pleasure is available to you all the time and it's really again about like managing uh managing managing whatever it is that you're going through so for example you know perimenopausal women menopausal women and then after this you know there's a huge hormonal shift happening there's a, a huge energetic shift happening so i think it's about learning what that looks like and then how again it's the same as like how you navigate that terrain and you know maybe um you know, uh, it looks like, whereas, you know, before you never, maybe you didn't ever use lubrication before. Now you look towards using lubrication as that's happening. You find that you're dry or um, uh, that you find it more difficult to become wet. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the case, you know, but it's just these things that happen to us. And also as well to recognize like as women, you know, we, we do go through rhythms, you know, and that there are times in our life where maybe we don't want to have sex, you know, mm -hmm. and that's also okay. Um, and I think what's a, what the bigger thing is, is can you have that open conversation with your partner or whoever that is um and and discuss that openly and and then find a middle ground or a meeting ground for this you know and it's all about as i said communication with yourself with others and how you navigate that and so absolutely like this i mean just because uh you know you're 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 finished menstruating doesn't mean like that's it you're past yourself that whole idea has been given to you you know this idea that 
beauty has a shelf life, that there is an expiry date um, on your sexuality. Those things have been given to you by the media, by just like walking around in general. And it's just not true, you know? So for me, it's always, it's all about how, how can you change your, like, how can you get conscious of the information you're being fed um, and how can you recognize what's yours and what's not yours, you know, mm-hmm. and then um, respond in accordance to that. Yeah, There's a very is- beautiful... <laughs> Okay, go on. Like, go on. Just say one thing. like as you move into this phase, like there's a really beautiful um, expression in terms of the archetype that you move into. That as a, as a woman who goes through this phase, it's a passageway, and it's a rite of passage that all women go through. And at the end of that passage, you actually step into what's called, like in the yoga circles and the yoga terms, as the wise woman or the sage. You know, so that you know you move into this space, like where you like almost like you become. Um, like the elder let's say in your community where younger women are coming to you you know like I often find that I'm missing this in my life you know I have a lot of younger girls like young in their in their like late teens early 20s who are messaging me and I recognize that they see me as someone who is ahead of them almost as an elder you know and I often um what I was searching for in my journey and and what I really wanted was to find women who have who've gone through the same thing as me and what does it look like on the other side you know like I have questions like is, what does true love look like you know what does it look like to be in a relationship with somebody uh facing challenges how did you navigate that and so I think it's really important that we have these people in our society they're pillars you know and we need them at all ages you know um so that we can turn to them and say I'm experiencing this like what was your experience of it because wisdom like experience experience equates to wisdom and we can't we can't deny that education can get you so far but a lived experience of it is is much more valuable than anything else and I think that's what I really as well would 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 love to kind of say to women like it's like you're you are not past your sell by date you are in a different phase of your life and it's just as beautiful and so valuable and you are needed you know you're need like I people like me like I you know as much work as I have done I need people you know like this is as well like you would experience it with um with Sophie being pregnant you know it's like my my sister as well like when when we become pregnant are oftentimes we turn to our mothers to say oh my god what do we do you know how do we cope with this how do we transition into being a mother you know and so it's it's these uh, pillars like the our pillars that we need you know to turn to for advice and for support Jenny, and- isn't a key to no sorry to cut you off just isn't the key to all a lot of these things is confidence too because uh, you know, you grew up being a, I would say, confident girl and, you know, you were raised in a lovely home. You have gorgeous mom and dad. You were confident and I would hope, you know, my own are the same, etc. And I would feel I'm a confident person. You have to be brave and confident. But be, when I was listening to you the night I did the class, you, your confidence came out um, and you seem to empower women and give women the confidence so that they could actually say, this is what I want in bed this is what i want to do it's not a, they it seems to me that women were struggling to say actually let those words come out of their mouth they were afraid to say it the men were in a position to say it i want this i want that from what from what i was listening to and just hearing from the women whereas i felt that they didn't have maybe because maybe as you say because they're looking at kim kardashian's body and think that they don't have it so they, they don't feel that they're in that position of power and like to do with everything to do with um to do with is saying what you want to and then receiving the pleasure as you're saying you know and then like right it's to do with everything isn't it confidence is the key really even when you're even when you're menopausal to come through it and feel well actually i'm still amazing and fabulous it's a confidence thing instead mm-hmm. of thinking I'm like an old hag, you cranky old hag. It, I mean, confi- we have to keep building our own confidences all the time and not allow, not allow social media to make us feel, well, we need more Botox and we need better eyebrows and we need longer eyelashes and we have to have plastic nails. And like, we really are so swamped by it all. Women are swamped yeah. by the yeah. image. 
And, and just to say one thing, it's like, you know, you, there's a thing, an interesting point to make, you know, because sometimes people talk about this idea of, you know, privilege or things like this. And it's like, well, you know, she grew up in a really great family or what, and, you know, she had great parents and support and all this kind of stuff. But what I will say is that like all children, like if you look at children, all children are born with confidence all children are born like you know it's like they're they're born as the center of their own universe you know and uh, and they they also as well express that confidence and they express it in many many different ways and um at, at a certain point uh, and this is all children at a certain point we get fed the information and it might not just be it might be from our friends it might be anywhere that um that you know some and again it's like it's like you know if you have too much confidence or you're too loud and mm -hmm. um, that you're you you might not get friends or people might not like you so you learn to make yourself smaller you know mm -hmm. and and we all get this i mean i had this for as an as amazing a childhood i had i also was given this information that if i'm too much if i'm too loud if i'm too me that um people won't like me and i have to mm -hmm. somehow like contain and manage myself and kind of share myself out in little pieces you know in kind of like manageable chunks you know? and, and we get fed this information so for me it's always like you know we confidence is something that you can learn and um, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you came from or who you are or how you feel about yourself it's it's a, an expression of and it's a it's a uh, yeah, it's an expression of, of your beingness, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's, and I think as well, like seeing women in their power, seeing women in who are confident mm -hmm. gives other women the permission to show up like this as well. And I think that's, you know, exactly what you're saying, you know, and it's, it's it so important. Me how women know, have, it just amazes me. I coach a little bit and um, it amazes me when I'm talking to um, people, how th their own self, esteem and self-belief is so low at times and they and they're actually fabulous people and they don't mm. even see it you know and that's why they can't make the step in the right direction because they just don't have that belief in themselves you know yeah but and I think and there's a couple of reasons for that as well like if you look at society and how what it tells us is that you know society tells us that in order to be successful you have to suffer you know and mm -hmm. um, that if you're not busy you're not uh you're you're not part of society you know like if you ask people like how are you you know yeah. the first thing so that people will say is oh i'm so busy you mm -hmm. know because it somehow means that you are needed you know if you're busy you're needed if you're not busy you know uh, you're somehow not needed and that's just not true you know it's not true that in order to be successful that you need to suffer you know that's just the information we've been given and so it's uh, it's something like it's it's just a huge shift in your in your entire world and you know like let's not let, like, let's not let's not like bash around the bush like either like this is it in order to step down like on this path it it's really difficult you know because it requires a whole lot of re rejigging how you are used to thinking mm -hmm. it requires mm -hmm. consistency with regards to living in a very particular way and like i mm -hmm. still have these things as well like you know i i love the woman that i am i can really truly say that i'm also i love my body you know and this is to say that um knowing from knowing where i've come from from, you know and um, mm -hmm. but I've always struggled with kind of having a fluctuating body where I'm like oh you know sometimes I eat more and exercise less you know like I've always struggled with this I haven't I wasn't given the kind of like you know thing of this is your skinny perfect body and you can eat whatever you want you know and, and I have a I have a beautiful I have a really nice uh, like I got my father's sweet tooth when it comes to eating you know things that I like and I love cakes you know I get pleasure from eating cakes and so um but for me to say that I love my body regardless, like doesn't mean that I don't wake up and still like look in the mirror and go, oh, I wish I was skinnier. Those thoughts still come up, but now mm. I catch them. And I say, is this mine or is this society? You know, is this mine or is it somebody else's? And I come back then to like feeling my own body, like feeling my own skin and saying, okay, well, you know, I feel like I feel plush, you know, I feel juicy, I feel voluminous, you know, I feel strong. And it's about 
reframing, um, you know, uh, catching your thoughts and reframing them so that you, and, and it's a constant effort and a constant work and process you have to be vigilant you know because these things come in all the time and uh, you have to be committed you know and this is why I say like this is the greatest you know coming on this journey and starting this is really the greatest love affair you will ever ever have with yourself you know and it's so important you know they always say everyone says this like I'm not like Oprah says this you know it's like the most important relationship you'll ever have is with yourself you know mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah, that's a note we're going to end on. Um, I mean, we, we, we have to end on some note because I have a whole lot of other things I'd like to talk to you about. Anyway, I know your last month has been absolutely mental, off the scale mental, because your classes have just taken off like a skyrocket. Um, and, and, and rightly so, because you're, I've seen some of the comments from the women and you're definitely uh, changing lives and making women feel better about themselves, which I just think is an absolutely fabulous thing. You are breaking barriers, Jenny. It's not always easy. And I know you're beautiful and you have a beautiful smile and a beautiful nature. It'll take its toll on you as well. So be careful of the exhaustion factor because it's not easy to break barriers. No, it's uh, definitely not. I'm already feeling that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I, somebody said to me about 30 years ago, the very, you know, you're breaking barriers. And I was thinking at the time, no, oh God, it's fabulous. I just love breaking barriers. It's amazing. That was something we were doing at the time. But, it, you know, just all I'm saying is it's, it's really hard work to break barriers sometimes, but it's also invigorating. And mm. some people are cut out to do it. Some people are not cut out to do it. You know, you're a type, I think. And really, it's suiting you so well because you are glowing. And um, so I just want to say thank you so much. To, first of all, thank you to everybody that's uh, bought tickets for this because it's the first fundraising thing we've ever done where there was absolutely no cost because you all gave your time free to us. So it was, the, it was fabulous from that point of view for us. And I want to thank you for that. And I want to just thank you for, being, for breaking down barriers that really, really needed to be broken down in this country and all over the world. So the world is your oyster, Jenny Keane. I don't know where you're going to go. I, th I definitely would see you sitting on Oprah's couch at some point or Ellen's couch because there's a few, the world needs to hear what you have to say because I've heard it in the classes. The world needs to hear it. Mm. Thank, thank you so much thank you so much Debbie like I mean I, I just love this like it's like full circle with I I said this to somebody earlier like I grew up in that kitchen that Debbie's <laughs> sitting in you know and so for me to like be back here and like also as well like I you know when you're talking about breaking barriers like I really believe that it's like the it's it's a community effort and this is what I'm also trying to create it's like not just one person like one person can only do so much but for me it's like can we like push together with this you know and like make Make a language around this like you know so that our children are growing up in a different with a different relationship you know with a different language around what sex is what their sexuality yeah. looks like and what pleasure is and I think that we do this like as a huge community and I would see you know like you giving me the time and space to even speak about this you know to yeah. be interested in this and to give a platform for that I mean we for me I'm we all need to be a big huge group of elders because there's young ones younger than us all coming along that need to hear how we feel and see and think about things you know and learn from us you and me and all of us you know yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for that. And thank the you. very best of luck with your, on your magnificent journey. Thank you so much, Jenny. <laughs> thank you so much, Debbie. Bye. <laughs>